I'm Kyle Simpson, um, and we are the honored panel that's been chosen to speak to you while you are gradually lazing into your food comas after lunch. So we're pretty excited about that. We'll try to keep it lively and fun today, uh, and, the, and, and hopefully my goal is that there's at least one chair thrown, but we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so I, uh, my name's, uh, probably most people know me as Getify Online. I'm an open web evangelist. I teach JavaScript, and I write about JavaScript got a series of books on it. So that's a, a little bit about me, but I wanted to quickly introduce my, my uh, panelists because they're actually the experts on the topic. Uh, so over here to my far right, your far left, is Matt Miller, co-founder of Lapwing Labs, correct? And uh, he told me in his, in his introduction that he really loves open source, which is great. He loves traveling. He's a big fan of SVG. Any SVG fans in the crowd? Yeah, all right. And I guess most favorite of all, he loves Docker. And many of us can also identify with that. So welcome, Matt Miller. To his left, we have David Beck, who founded Rotunda or just worked for Rotunda? That's true, founded. Founded Rotunda Software. I thought, I thought that was true. Uh, he's worked on a software. It's, a, it's an asset pipeline build tool called Cartera. So we'll definitely want to keep the difference between build tools and package managers. They can kind of overlap. I we'll want to keep those separate. But he's built a tool in the build tool space. He told me that he's most passionate about burning IE8 to the ground. And I think most of us can agree <laughs> that's a pretty good thing to be passionate about. <laughs> All right. And then we have Josh Peck. Peak. Peak. Sorry. Pardon me. Josh Peak works for GitHub. And I want everybody to cheer and applaud because he uh, helped write the side-by-side -side diffs feature that just launched on GitHub. And I think it could be one of the most amazing things that's ever happened in GitHub's history. So, But also on that same token, when I asked him to tell me about himself, he wrote in very tiny letters, I work for Bauer. So we'll hear, I guess, more about that on our panel today. And then over here on my left, your right, we have Laurie Voss, who is the CTO of NPM. And Laurie wanted to make sure that we remind everyone that NPM is spelled lowercase and it is not an acronym for anything. <laughs> so keep that clear. But more seriously, I've, I found him in our conversations to be very reasoned and thoughtful about evolving NPM to serve the needs of the collective developer community. So we're glad to have him. And finally, last but not least, Dominic Denicola to my left. Dominic uh, works for Google. He's on the Chrome team. He spearheaded the ES6 promises. By the way, thank you so much for that. Uh, promises are awesome. He is also a con contributor of controversial features to NPM, such as peer <laughs> dependencies. So we can all thank him for that as well. Uh, and he is the foremost authority on Star Wars, the Old Republic. So maybe if we have time in the overflow session, we can talk about that. But he will also open us up now with a setup of what package managers are and why we should be caring about them. So I'll turn it over to Dominic. Thank you. Um, kind, of, kind of wishing I made this a Star Wars themed package <laughs> management intro, uh, but I didn't, so, so oh well. Uh, so to me, the, the way I try and approach the package management space is to, to think about really what we've done as a community with the web over, over the last 10 years or so. Because I don't know about you guys, but I used to be very proud back in fifth grade to call myself a, a webmaster. All right, and, and so times have changed a little bit, and now we try and think of ourselves as a little bit more like software engineers. And, and I know my personally, you know, getting out of school and uh, reading all these books, you know, patterns of enterprise application architecture and domain-driven design and refactoring and so on, you know, the things that keep coming up over and over again are topics like modular architecture and, and separation of concerns and proper ways of code reuse and, and structuring your code. And so kind of the first level of these patterns and this, this modularity idea is modules. And in JavaScript, I'd say we got this, right? Like we've figured out how to do modules. And maybe you know, you're trying to decide whether you want to wrap your modules in a define wrapper or you don't, or if you want to use syntax or just functions. But that's not like the most important thing. The most important thing is that we all understand we should be separating our code into modules. And nobody is dropping script tags into their body anymore, or, or worse, into their head. Um, so uh, the thing to understand about modules, you know, if we got this, right, is they let you reuse your own code and, and maybe work within your own project and reuse other people's code on your team. But we need to go to the next level, and that's where packages comes in, right? So uh, packages let you reuse code written by somebody else and packaged up and distributed for you as a third party. Um, and so there's, there's several key concepts when you're talking about package management that you want to keep in mind. So, the, the package is a set of files, and usually with some metadata about the package, things like the name, the version, the description, uh, and, and the dependencies, which is important. 
Um, then there's the registry concept, which is where you put those packages on the internet so that you can go and install them from. And then finally, you have the idea of a package manager, which is something that allows you to install packages from the registry onto your local machine for, for your apps and your, your development. And crucially, also, a package manager's role is to install the dependencies of a package that you want on your machine. And this is great because it encapsulates the details of how a package is built. So if Ember package, as a package, depends on the route recognizer package, when you say you know, install Ember, whatever your favorite package manager is, um, the, you don't care about how it implements routing, but it says, oh, I need route recognizer to get my job done. So that gets taken care of for you by a, a good package manager. So in terms of package managers and, and packages and the whole ecosystem, you know, this is not a new idea. Right? This is, we have this stuff in all these other ecosystems, and we have it in Node for, for JavaScript. You know, it's, it's really crucial for code reuse, and so every mature web language and, and ecosystem has them. However, you know, on the web, we're not so sure what our answer is, and that's one of the reasons that we're here today. I mean, we figured it out for server-side JavaScript with NPM, and some people, myself included, think that we should be using that for all JavaScript, but other people don't, and, and that's kind of one of the things we want to talk about. Uh, so I think kind of going into the whole discussion, there are several areas specifically about web, web and package managers that to me are complex and we need to think about together. And so what, what makes the web in particular a hard problem to solve for package managers? Well, first, there's, there's like how related are packages to modules, right? Some early package managers, things like Volo or Jam, bet on AMD. Others these days like Component and Duo, bet on CommonJS. Uh, Bower has a mix. NPM has a strong CommonJS community, but it doesn't actually mandate CommonJS in any way intrinsically. Uh, and, and of course, some people think ES6 modules will save us all, and that's what's going to make package management work finally for the web. Um, and so depending on your perspective, I think modules and packages can either be totally unrelated, and it's just one of the things you put into a package, or they can be entirely intertwined. Another issue that comes up on the web is, is different asset types, right? So we all pretty much understand how to put source code into a package. We've done this you know, both in Node and in other ecosystems and other languages. And, and that's great because that's, that's pretty easy. There's no complexity in just one language. But when you have the web, you have you know, at least three languages. And so you have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you've got fonts and images and all that. Uh, and, and so this gets complicated because things like CSS have a global effect, unless you're using web components. Or like fonts definitely have a global effect, and there's, there's not really a way to encapsulate that unless you rename them. Right? So, so does this change how we think about package management is, is my question. Kind of this plays into the question of you know, deduplication and how this plays into semantic versioning, which is a big, big issue that divides kind of some of the package managers today. So like, what if one of your dependencies wants to use package foo at version 1.0 and another wants to use package foo at version 2.0? Now remember, I said that part of the idea of the package manager is to encapsulate you from worrying about what your dependencies are using. But, you know, should we allow duplicates to exist in your source tree? And you know, maybe you say no, because you should never have duplicate code on the web. But does your answer change if it's a 30-byte number formatting thing? Like, is, does that work? Or what about if it's jQuery 1.0 versus 2.0? Well, that's, that's kind of a different story. Or what about if it's something like underscore or backbone that doesn't even use semantic versioning at all, so you have no signal for whether you should be including these two different things? Uh, I mean, uh, this, this is a pretty hard, answer, hard, hard question to answer, I think, and it's kind of at the core of some of the disagreements between web package managers. Finally, uh, there's, there's the issue of web components, right, which in some ways make things better. They give you an encapsulated, packaged up, you know, reusable component, and in some ways they make it worse because they share this global flat namespace of tag names, you know, unlike the kind of idea in JavaScript where you can say, I'm going to include another JavaScript file and it's not going to interfere if it's well written, it's a module. You know, in, with web components, I reserve this tag name for myself. And then, you, and then to complicate it all, as part of web components, you have this HTML import technology. You know, how, remember how I said that, that nobody these days is putting script tags in their head or their body? Well, instead, what they're doing is they're putting link rel equals import tags in their head. Um, so we're back in the 90s with, with HTML imports, which is, you know, interesting. Um, so, so that's what I got on kind of the big issues on package management on the web, and ready to go. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Let's welcome this thing. 
I think that's a fantastic way to set up where we're going to go. There are so many different directions that we could talk about, and we, we had to narrow them down. But I just want to remind everyone, if, if you had forgotten, there is a breakout session later this afternoon. And so if we have to cut things off or if we skip over a detail that you think is really important, please do come and find us in those breakout sessions. We'd love to chat more. Uh, just last night at dinner, just one of these few questions that we're going to go over, we spent an hour or more talking about it. So there's lots to talk about, lots to dig into. Uh, without any further ado, we'll go to our first question. And our first question says, which of the characteristics are important for managing, uh, for package managers to focus on? So let me give you some examples, panel, to set this up. Some examples like package creation, maintenance overhead, curation. How do we know that the, that the code there does what it says it's supposed to do and that it's going to be good quality and not harm the systems? Discoverability and even responsive, responsiveness of the teams. These are issues that, that we deal with in the package manager ecosystem. So let's talk about which ones are important. And importantly, actually, I'll throw this first to Josh since you do have some experience on Bower. How well are the package managers doing on these different metrics? Well, I do say, I think the one difference, I do like the difference that uh, Dominic has broken down in terms of like the concerns that these things are dealing with, like publishing the registry and the actual like install tool. So I think Bower is interesting in that it doesn't actually have any publishing mechanism. It's just you put it on the web. It's just on the web via a Git URL. So that's just handled however using existing Git tools. And the registry is super lightweight. So it's more on the lines of the build tool. And so you kind of, it's kind of dependent on the existing ecosystem like GitHub in terms of how we discover these things and maintain them. And I think the uh, primarily Bower is the tool end of it. Of like how do you like download all these dependencies, resolve dependencies, and deal with that. That's interesting that you would say, because I think many people would probably put Bower firmly in the same category as something like NPM. I certainly would as a user, because there's a command line tool that I have to do, and I have to manage a, a bower.json file. Oh. So can you tell me, maybe you guys can kind of fight over this, but, but why are you different then? If Bower really isn't quite in the same category as NPM, what is that? Because as a developer, it sure feels like they're a lot the same. Um, I don't know. I think the, uh, the, the flow, I mean, at, at I think the Bower flow is definitely feels easier to publish um, as opposed to NPM. But I, I, there's definitely benefits to having a separate package that you can like publish. Like Bower doesn't actually have a good story for like how it's doing mirrors and replication. Like NPM does this. So what about that, Laurie? NPM is bad for publishing. <laughs> <laughs> NPM, is, NPM is just a lot more. Uh, it does a lot more stuff. I'm, I was going to say it's a lot more heavyweight, but I don't think that's the word I want to use. It's um, NPM has decided a bunch of things are important. It's decided that you want to be able to publish a, an, a single artifact and say that that artifact is there and constant forever. Uh, and you want to be able to, you know, the mirroring and replication you sort of get for free by accident of the database that we use. But it's more about we want all of this metadata attached, but we want you know, a delivery mechanism established that is not the same as our source control mechanism. I think that's really important. I think committing your build artifacts to your source control just so that they can be consumed by, you know, a package manager is uh, really unfortunate. And it's something that's prevented me from having Bower in, in projects where people ask me to. It's like, no, I'm not going to commit my compiled What's the disadvantage version. of that, though? Like, what's the disadvantage to having them in source code and, like, actually version them? What are you losing? Oh, uh, the ability to keep my source separate from my output. So right? you, like it, it's like can, committing .exes to yeah, your repo. You, you can would never have do different that. repos, different branches. Like what? What else? Right. Other you, you could set up. You could use Git as a, a package repository, but why would you? But in, in the big, I mean, let's not lose sight of the big picture. NPM is the Node package manager. So if you want to use Node packages, no. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. The Remember, it's not the acronym. Manager. We got that. It's the only package manager you can use with Node, or that people use with Node. So if you want to use, you know, so it has that feature of it. And Bower is very much more of a client-side package manager. It has inclined itself, or you know, it, people are inclined to use it for for client-side packages and. Just to be, uh, I have been. I want to sketch this out. You guys can agree or disagree, but it seems like there are a few different layers of, of packages, and uh, the the landscape is as such. There's server side packages, which are handled by npm exclusively. There are client side JavaScript packages, only JavaScript packages, which are handled by npm and also by Bower. 
there are packages that have CSS and other assets in them and their client-side packages, and those can be handled by NPM with Cartero, for example, but they're mostly handled, I think, by Bower, also by component. Mm -hmm. And then you have web components below that, which nobody really knows how they're gonna handle at this point, but it's looking like it's gonna be Bower. And then there's just CSS packages, which I think is another uh, you know, level, and that is mostly handled just by Bower. So, so, so I, I'm sorry to jump in, but I wanna refocus this on the specifics because, uh, Matt, let me throw it to you. Can you talk about maybe one or two really important characteristics of the package manager of your choice or ones that you maybe have worked with? What are they doing? What, you know, what, are, what are the most important things that they should be focusing on? And maybe some areas that they're not focusing enough yet. Yeah, so um, I created Duo basically because I wanted a way to pull in any source, any code from anywhere, basically. That was the idea, and have it build for you. And I think we're talking a lot about the installer being different from the builder. And I, I would argue that that's not necessarily, like it doesn't necessarily have to be different. Um, and so a lot of what Duo does is basically you can install from literally anywhere. That's the goal anyway. Right now it's from GitHub, but eventually it'll be from anywhere. Like you can basically go to any site, you can take a look at where they're including and then require it immediately. And so that's kind of the goal. And I guess the other thing that, so like basically ease of use like is probably one of my most important things. And the other thing is reproducibility. So basically being able to like build something and then be expected to like six months later build that same thing again. And I, I can't say Duo has an answer to it. I don't think any of the other package managers really do it very well. Um, but I think that's NPM something. NPM tries that, very hard. Yes. NPM tries very hard, yeah. We're, we're going to take a couple of comments in just a moment. I want to let you uh, <laughs> elaborate a little bit more in NPM's defense. But we'll take comments from Sarah <coughs> and Rachel. So if we can cue them up, let's make sure to do that. But tell us, what is NPM doing that, uh, in, in your own defense? So um, NPM, I've, this is something I've been discussing with a bunch of people today. NPM has multiple roles. Like when you are NPM installing, are you NPM installing because I want this software so that I can play with it and build my application, in which case it is a dev tool. Or am I NPM installing because I am deploying this to a box somewhere, in which case why am I installing my tests and my docs and all of that stuff? Like that shouldn't really, like there's a difference between a build artifact and a package of software. Um, and at the moment, NPM is definitely optimized for uh, the latter of those two use cases. Um, but people keep trying to use it for the other thing. Um, so we are starting to, to uh, support that better. The shrink wrap feature of, um, of NPM is, is sadly neglected and uh, was until quite recently unusable um, because it was possible to publish version 1.1.1 and then publish dash F 1.1.1 again and have it be a completely different bit of software which just breaks that whole idea. Um, okay, let's take You can't do that anymore. Is, is this Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, so Going back a bit, um, you mentioned generated code and checking that into version control. Um, that's been a big problem for me and my teams personally, so I, I generally strongly advocate against doing it because it causes all sorts of merge issues. Um, I wanted to see what sort of solutions you guys had in place for deploying generated code and just managing that process. Yeah, I mean, I'll t briefly, I think the, the answer from NCN's perspective is very clear. Your package contains the generated code. Your source repository contains the source code. And as part of the pre-published process, you generate, and then you put the generated code in the package. Or you so, build so, it as part of your install process as a, as a post-install hook. Yeah. So Josh, I know you happen to have a slightly different perspective on this. Tell us why GitHub and, and those tools able, allow you to manage all of that crazy merge nightmare that Sarah was talking about. Well, yeah, I'm definitely of the approach if you're deploying something to reduction, you want to limit your third-party dependencies. Like, you don't want to depend on NPM being up or some other server being up during your deploy process. Like, having some other host go down shouldn't take you down. So, like, I think it just makes sense to check in as many of those artifacts as you can. If, if it's something, if it's, it, the burden of doing that, I think, is a lot less than having a availability dependency. Is Rachel out there? Rachel, did we get a microphone to Rachel? Yes, no? Okay. 
I was yeah, do make sure you raise your hands whenever you're going to ask a question. I was going to specifically call out, you know, when we're talking about build artifacts versus source code, uh, you know, the, the multiple vectors of images, CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. The package management versus build system separation works a lot better when you've got a close link between module, source code, and, and package where you're only importing one thing. Um, it's just not really working well when you have all these other assets. We, yeah, so de definitely thank you for your comment. We definitely are planning to tackle this idea of other resource types other than JavaScript. So we'll, we'll come back to that and revisit that topic in a little bit. I want to switch now to our, our second question. Our second question is going to go a little bit deeper. So it, it, we're going to uncover sort of this holy war, this debate that's actually happening, whether we articulate it as that or not. And that question is, what are the relative benefits of specialized package managers? In other words, should we be having a new package manager with every framework that comes out versus one package manager to rule them all? David. <laughs> Thank you, Brian LaRue, for that comment. So, so to me, the biggest, most important benefit you can get from a package manager is the network effects of reusing a large package ecosystem. So I mean, you know, earlier they brought up the different types of packages being put in different package managers. Uh, to me, I'm most interested in the overlap. What is the JavaScript code I'm writing that doesn't matter whether it runs on the server or the client, and I can just reuse it in either case? And if you're saying, oh, I have to make a choice whether this goes in my client package manager or my server package manager, that really impacts and limits my ability to do code reuse in the general case. And, and in general, it's, it's very frustrating to say that I must make that choice. I'd rather have a JavaScript package manager. So yeah. NPM gets. You know, one of NPM's most common feature requests from everybody else is, can you please build whatever feature X it is that I'm, that I, is forcing me to use this as the package manager? Can you please just make NPM do everything? Like, we were joking the other day that NPM has now become the way that you install other package managers. Um, <laughs> Which is true. Yeah. <laughs> right. You NPM install all of the other package managers, and we're like, fine, that's what we do now. Uh, but you want. What I think what NPM is moving towards, like, as we discussed last night, is um, instead of saying, picking one way and saying, this is how you do it, NPM is going to say, here's the bunch of things that we can do. By default, this is how it works. If you want to change one aspect of this process, don't rebuild a package manager. We will modularize. And you can use steps one through five and change how step six works. And NPM will enable that behavior. That's how we would prefer it. Like, you know, no one is going to radically change storing bits on a server. Like, that's going to be the same no matter what. What changes most often is how you install the bits once they land on your server. Um, so, so that's a great way to articulate the, the eventual, you know, there's package managers everywhere, but there's one set of code that's running it, which is, which is fine. But I, wanna, I, I feel like I want to represent sort of the more common man approach to this, the rent is too damn high approach, because it's too damn difficult to manage all of my packages and all of my metadata across all of those different things. So what about that? What about this idea that maybe one day there is just one and, and there's a dash dash Bower flag inside of NPM? But just one what? For which of those areas? Like, because there, you know, there are different overlapping areas here. So one package manager for, for which of those? Clearly the CSS, you know, if you're just managing CSS packages, that's not really JavaScript. And it seems that these sort of package manager monopolies, as I think natural monopolies happen on a given language, which we don't have right now. But you know, JavaScript or I mean CSS is not JavaScript and web components I think arguably are not really JavaScript either. It's more like they're HTML and then they have JavaScript inside of them. So just to be clear, I mean, you know for me the ideal situation would be to have NPM working the server side, the client side JavaScript and the, the component ish JavaScript, where you have JavaScript components that also have CSS and, and HTML assets. So your vote is more for the single package manager eventually? Uh, does anybody one, vote for multiple package managers? Thing, I, mean, I thing, think a lot of people yeah. do, so, so that's like, what we're trying to do. One thing I would like to point out is the concerns are a bit different in the client and the server, and one of those concerns is file size. And so one example of this that comes to the top of my head is um, trying to make Cheerio or something like that work in the browser. And you end up, like, Cheerio's great on the server side, but you end up with a bunch of artifacts and stuff. Like, you end up with, like, a 300 kilobyte file that you're basically loading onto the browser. 
And so I would argue that it's good for the server, but not necessarily a good idea for the browser. And having a single package for that is not, I don't think that's, that's ideal. Well, they can, do, they can do one for the server, one for the browser. I mean, then. Yeah, it's possible. So let's, let's bring Bower into this a little bit more explicitly. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. if we go back a couple of years to the history of where Bower sprung up, at least my understanding of it is that Bower was springing up because there was concerns that NPM wasn't serving some of the needs that, that needed to. So speak to that specifically. What, what's missing from some of these package managers that required the specialization? I think one of the uh, things that started off was that uh, the way to do it on NPM, if you wanted to do front-end packages, was to essentially do what Browserify is doing today. And it didn't really encourage any other sort of like paths like People were doing web component-ish things before, and that doesn't quite fit into how uh, like uh, common JS modules work. So I think the idea was that we would have a more open system that was like decoupled from build tools, and the package manager would be, in some sense, dumber. And like you can have build tools that can operate on AMD. Uh, CGS and then future ES6 modules. So I'm going to give you a chance to respond that he just called your package manager dumb, but we'll take a comment from, <laughs> I'm picking I think, yeah. I think I call, my, call Maybe, myself yeah. dumb. Pa we're going to take some comments from Patrick and Taryn, so if we can get their micro microphones. But w what about that? Do you, do you see that the specialization is just layering of the package manager, that there's different parts of the package manager that handle these different concerns? I think it's, um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm close to what Dave said. I think there's a very open question as to whether, because NPM is the package manager for Node, can NPM be the package manager for client-side stuff? Because NPM can be, the man, can be the package manager for JavaScript, I think. I think that would be easy, but that's not what people want it to be. People want it to be the way that I install a widget into my application, and the concerns of, of pure JavaScript versus how do we do client-side stuff are sufficiently different that it's not, it's definitely not resolved like within NPM's offices whether or not that's a thing that we can eventually nail or whether I, or not that is a different thing. You can thing. nail it, but you, I think you lose some of the elegance of NPM where everything just works mostly, except for maybe pure dependencies. But inside <laughs> the world, I, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean that lightly. I mean, there are some things that are complicated even in the pure JavaScript world, but not many of them. But, but in the CSS world, it does become more complicated. But that doesn't mean that the value that you would bring by tackling you know, that niche of JavaScript modules inside the browser doesn't outweigh the, the, the added complexity. So Patrick, do you have, is Patrick got a microphone? There we go. Uh, Dominic mentioned the like, great network effect of NPM and how it's great that you can pretty much find anything just by NPM search, et cetera. The issue is that you have no idea whether or not that'll actually work in the browser. I don't know if you, I'm going to have to browserify this. I don't know if I'm going, or if, even after that, if it will work. Whereas with Bower, generally it's either completely broken or it does work to some level in the browser. We have such a great answer for that. Um, <laughs> uh, that's been a repeated question, especially from the browserify people and various other people doing browser stuff. The, uh, the new version of the NPM website, which is currently being busily worked upon, um, has the concept of ecosystems, where we have said that people don't use NPM for one thing. So trying to lock everything into a single concept of search and a single like, metric of what is best is impossible. So ecosystems are basically slices of the registry. So you will put your eco, you will put, you will uh, in some way tag or have a programmatic way of recognizing that this package is compatible with this ecosystem and it will get automatically included into this search. So you can say, search only for things that are going to work in a browser and tell me what they are. Search only for the things that are good for robots. Search only for the things that work for you know, this particular uh, um, framework. Okay, uh, and I think that's really powerful because you can have things that work with Browserify, things that work with Require.js, you know, if people still use that, it, things that work with uh, web components in particular, you know, things that, that tie into that global registry. And so that way you can say, oh, okay, well, two web components have the same tag name. I guess I shouldn't use those together, right? So, so this ecosystems concept, I'm really excited for it to land because um, then it'll be, everything will be better. <laughs> Taryn, are you out in the, the crowd? There we go. So um, I... Uh, for a while, built a build tool around Bower. Um, so, how do you uh, kind of think of? Um, Let's make sure we don't stray into extra questions. We can tackle those in the other session. But did did you have a point that you want to make about difficulty with that? Yeah, it's uh, you don't really know what you're going to get when you get when it's downloaded from GitHub. And so, this week it might be CoffeeScript precompiled. Next week it might be in a different directory. 
where the coffee script has been pre-compiled to, or maybe it's not pre-compiled at all, and now you have to figure out what language this package is in this particular, you know, git commit hash. And I don't know, like, what tooling you, you plan on kind of to put around that so you have a better idea of, of what you've actually installed and how you can use it. I think to Dominic's point about, you know, the package being more about build, you know, built assets that are ready to deploy more than source, that can begin to address those things. But certainly it's up to each individual author, right? To yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think that's the thing is, is it's really cultural. Uh, in NPM, there is a strong cultural bias towards JavaScript, not CoffeeScript. You know, if you want to write CoffeeScript, you precompile it first. And, and honestly, towards CommonJS modules. And, and I think that CommonJS modules, especially as we go towards ES6 and whatever, will be challenged. Uh, but I think it is great to have a convention that we don't publish CoffeeScript to the registry. And you could if you want, but I think it's nice that we don't. OK, so I, I suspected that that first question might not get as specific that I, as I wanted to, particularly on one topic, and that is the challenges of metadata. So our third question that we're going to go to is specifically, what can we do, so let me make sure I read this correctly, what can package managers and developers do to streamline the overhead of package metadata, especially across multiple package managers? Just stop so, using other package yeah, managers, that's obviously. obviously. <laughs> that's the obvious softball <laughs> answer, or, but let's... Uh, I think or the, just g give each package manager the domain, you know, a clear domain. But as a, as a, as a package owner, owner myself, I author code, and I'm constantly getting requests to, hey, can you add the new bower.json, and then when a new one comes out, will you please, you know, it's a pull request to add that. And then it's a maintenance overhead for me. I know there are tools yeah, right, that can manage. I totally agree with what you're saying, and I think the way that we need to solve this is, I think we, if we can actually standardize on the metadata format and all get on package JSON, then we don't have to have a fragmentation. But that means, that also means having NPM give up like full control over what package JSON is. So NPM is already incredibly loosey-goosey about what package <laughs> JSON is. Uh, you know, we have a schema-less database, for better or worse. So anything that you put in package JSON gets in there and you know, is indexable and, and you know, replicates to the entire world. So people, you know, a lot of the stuff that NPM does arrived there by accident. People just started putting in their main JS. They started putting in the files thing. They start, you know, like they just, files, exactly. right. They just started adding stanzas to package.json. Eventually, we were like, well, that, that cow path seems OK. Let's pave it. Yeah, I think if we had some sort of community effort to standardize how these, thing, these metadata fields work, um, I think we, there's a lot in common between all of these package tools. Again, this is more from like, OK, so the, if we can de decide how package.json works, then you can have other sorts of build tools that understand package.json. And that can, I think, really help other communities that aren't doing Node.js. Like, there's still tons of Java people writing web servers, and they want to use uh, front end packages. So. But in all fairness, rather than putting a Bower field into package JSON, they created a separate file. And in fact, how can we stop that from happening with all the other specialized package managers? Well, I, again, I think that's getting people on board and like, what, what do we share in common? And is there, like, how do we actually extend this for, like, other, I think getting back to the question about the, uh, build tools thing. I don't want to go too much in build tools, but I think there is an overlap in the manifest of how do build tools interop interoperate with uh, these metadata fields. Yeah, and, and to me, my favorite example of this, the easiest one, is if you're building a web component and distributing it on NPM and, and you want to reserve a tag name, you should probably, like somebody should take the lead and say, the standard here is put a tag name, you know, X flip box in your package JSON, and then if you see two X flip boxes in the project, you're like, oh shit, okay, my build tool needs to do something about this, or my my tooling needs to do something about this. And you know, probably we wouldn't bake that into NPM. It's not really shouldn't necessarily need to be aware of web components, but it's a strong convention. And if we as a community can agree on that, or even just a large, you know, starter community, whether it be Polymer or whatever, that, that would be a great start. Just to play devil's advocate. Be before you do, let's make sure we queue up uh, Murdad and Rachel have some comments from the floor. So go ahead. So um, at least from my experience, and I think some of this stuff could be solved with like the separate ecosystems and possibly a standardized format, but from 
uh, my position, a lot of times when you go to a repository, you have no idea, does this work on the client side, does this work on the server side? And so it's kind of nice actually like having two manifests, like especially one that's like component.json or something like that, where you're like, okay, I know this is going to work, or like a Bower, like I know this is gonna work, or it's meant to work on the, on the client side versus this could possibly work on the server and it might work on the browser, in the browser too. And, if there was just a component, ideally, Sorry. I, I hope we're going towards a world where it's clear the, which package manager you use is clear based on the nature of, of your package, in which case there really shouldn't be, I mean, the overlap, it may be coincidental, but it's not guaranteed that they're going to be the same fields that are important. I mean, ideally, and there, they're, there they're does feel like there's a lot of overlap right now. There is a so lot it of does overlap right those waters. Especially in that space where you have JavaScript client-side packages with other assets, which is a huge space right now. I mean, it's Ember, it's, it's Backbone, it's Angular to some degree. All of those are JavaScript logic with, that have additional resources on them. And it, not only that, but it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's, it's hugely valuable for a, an internal application to structure their application in such a modularized way, and also for sharing with package managers. So there's a huge potential there to, to, to get a lot of value from standardizing some of that stuff. Merdan. So um, my question goes back to basically understanding two things. One is, what is the exact role of especially client-side package managers? And back to the question of standards. I want to remind that we want to save questions for the breakout session. So okay. can you, can you uh, share so, an opinion about this, how yeah. it's difficult specifically for you? So when I think about client-side package managers, I mean, traditionally, you can think of HTML and browser itself as a package manager. You specify your resources in your HTML with proper URLs, you reference like different CDNs with different versions of jQuery and whatever, and you get your package kind of for deployment. But now for like client side, especially package managers, they seem to be mostly focused on build only and build in terms of download something from somewhere else on my local machine so that I have a repeatable process. Now that it's on my machine, I can apply some scripts or whatever and then deploy that way. So, I think if we clarify what exactly is the flow and where they fit in this flow and what they provide, a lot of these questions could be answered. Otherwise, just using package manager for installing and deploying stuff, I see a lot of overlap. I mean, if you go especially with the standardization, HTML and manifest is one of the attempts that they had for standardizing. So I know you have a disagreement in that definition of what package managers do, so clarify please. Right, yeah, I mean, so I, I think what I'm hearing is, is you know, uh, you're thinking, how is this different from our script tag world, right? And I think it's different in a few key ways. First of all, it's reproducible. You're not depending on somebody's external URL to, to have the same content there from day to day. You know, second, it takes care of dependencies for you, right? So if I include backbone and it needs underscore, that needs to get taken care of for me instead of, hey, put these two script tags or these five script tags or these 20 script tags in your head. And, and third, it's, it's just like, it's a way of getting it all tied together into one flow where you're like npm install ember and all these things get installed and then you have a build tool or maybe you do script tags like you do with Bower. You put those in your, in your head uh, or wherever uh, or use a module system, right? But, but the important thing is it takes care of dependencies for you and, and I think that's really what a package manager is about uh, more so than the world where you just do script tags. It seems like one of the most important pieces of metadata that can possibly exist is the version number. So we're going to transition to a specific <laughs> question about version numbers and about semantic versioning. So the recent controversy over semantic versioning asks whether or not it's even reasonable to have meaningful and interoperable version numbers. What was, must we all do to bring sanity to this space? And I'll throw it to, specifically to Dominic. Are we at edge 4.0 or edge 0.4? <laughs> Oh, man. OK, so 0.x versions are, are an unfortunate <laughs> situation where I think it's just because NPM for a long time had 0 as their default for your starting, where people were like, oh, I'll publish 0.x. And then semver.org is like, 0.x doesn't mean semantic. It, it could change at any time. And that's a whole mess. But I, I do think, kind of getting to the larger question of, of semantics and versions and what we can do, uh, I think if we as a community can agree to semver, that enables some really powerful abilities, especially on the client side. Because if you have two packages using you know, Ember uh, 1.x and 2.x, then you need to know, OK, this is not going to work together, right? Or, or maybe it does if something, it's something smaller, like date formatter library 1.x and 2.x. That will work together, right? But you need the ability to have this insight into what are the conflicts. 
And if you don't use semantic versioning, then you have no way of kind of automating that. You can't say, oh, well, this guy needs Ember 1.7, or let's do backbone. This guy needs backbone 1.6, and this guy needs backbone 1.7. Now I have to remember that backbone doesn't follow semantic versioning, so I can't actually coalesce those. I have to say, oh, there's a conflict. Whereas if it's something that does follow semantic versioning, you can see those conflicts more clearly. So I guess, I mean, it's hard to give an answer of just we should all do Semver, because I think the question is kind of asking, like, Semver never works, so what's going on? So uh, but is, is the, is the git commit well tag a universal that, version? Can we yeah. just standardize on that and get rid of semantic versions? Uh, no, I think you use Semver in git commits, or okay. git tags. So you, the the problem with Semver is that everyone thinks they know what Semver is, and they don't. When you get to the edge cases, the split between how, when, you know, when it's ambiguous, the split between, these, the, between the cases is nearly 50-50, and that's the problem. Like, if we could agree what Semver was, then it would be great. And we agree for about 90% of use cases. And the final 10%, which is where all the problems happen, there's no consensus at all. It seems like the 0.x is really the yeah. biggest area of confusion. Zero so can you provide some clarity on that? So the, it depends what you think should happen, right? The, the, the way that NPM, as of 2.0.0, which was released last week, everyone should download it. Um, <laughs> The way that it works is uh, basically the most significant digit is considered the major version. So if you are 0.0.1, then 0.0.1 is considered incompatible with 0.0.2. But if you are 0.1.1, then 0.1.1 and 0.1.2 are considered minor features. I'm already completely lost. Anybody right. <laughs> Whereas everybody is everybody's fairly clear once you're in 1.0, that 1.0 to 2.0 is a breaking change. 1.1 to 1.2 is a feature change. And 1.1.2 to 1.1.3 is a minor change. Like, so does zero.x just need to go away entirely? That is sort of, we changed the default. We changed npm init to create all packages at 1.0.0 simply because 0.x was so confusing to everybody. Just start at 1.0. Like, integers are free. You can use as many of them as you like. <laughs> Excellent. What are you guys' thoughts on like simplifying the like teal day versus carrot versus all those? Like, <laughs> what's up with that? Um, Version ranges for those of you. Yeah. We we have a lot of of lively discussions about that in the office. Um, the point of introducing the carrot range was to try and clarify the semantics of the tilde, which were in, were in turn to try and clarify the, the semantics of the dot x, which is what everyone was using before yeah. that. Everyone understands what dot x is, does. It's like that x is a variable. And tilde means uh, like uh, 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 minor versions are OK. And caret is supposed to mean uh, feature versions are OK, but not breaking changes, um, which is great if you understand those semantics. And then as soon as you get into the zero dot x, people are like, oh, but I thought this was a feature change. It turns out that it's a breaking change, and it all goes to hell. Um, so again, past 1.0, uh, tilde versus caret is pretty, is, is pretty easy. And before zero, it's just a hellscape from which no one will escape. Gotcha. So, so I think what's really interesting is uh, one of my friends, Yehuda Katz, is doing the cargo package manager for Rust. And he has the benefit of, of being Greenfield, right? This is a very new package manager. His semantics are, you don't have any of these crazy uh, punctuations but it always follows semantic versioning. So if you put 1.2.3 in your package or your cargo dot, dot yeah, toml, uh, seriously, toml, um, if you put it in there, then you will get anything in the 1.2.1 series that is greater than 1.2.3, uh, which is great. You don't have to remember any of this. It just follows semantic versioning. Uh, and then you know, what he does is if you really need to pin it, which is an important capability if, if somebody's being badly behaved, you do equals 1.2.3. So I, I kind of wish that we could just rewind the clock and, and use those semantics instead of inventing all these punctuations. But uh, just something to be wistful about, I guess. Matt, what do you think? It, are, the, are the version numbers that you deal with in your software, are they easy for you to reason about as well as the, those that consume your software? Um, I would say for the most part. Um, I'm, personally, I'm confused about the tildes and the carrots and stuff and, and when you should use them, when you shouldn't. Uh, I get them wrong all the time. Yeah. I, I think that's one of the reasons yeah. why, like, for instance, when, when the underscore controversy happened, I think that's one of the arguments that was made is if it's that complex, maybe we need to find a simpler system. Yeah, and then the da you have a dash, beta, beta 2, beta 3, <laughs> beta 4. Like, it's just, it's really, it seems a little bit overly complex, and maybe there's reason for that, but maybe we should reevaluate. 
the whole. I, I, and I think there is a good reason, which is the deduplication, right? So if, if I depend on caret 1.2.3 and the other person depends on caret 1.4.0, we should be able to install 1.4.0 and both of us use that. And that's a great benefit. Um, so, so that's the plus. I mean, I agree it's complex, but it does have payoffs. Do version numbers for packages become kind of like they are for browsers, which are just arbitrary marketing labels at that point? <laughs> well, ideally not. I mean, you know. So, so browsers are perpetually stuck on Semver 1.0. In fact, the entire web is perpetually stuck on Semver 1.0. You cannot make backwards breaking changes in a browser. So browser version numbers are, are arbitrary just because otherwise we would always be incrementing like the patch or the, the feature. And that's kind of, nobody wants to be Firefox 1.37.43. Like, the yeah. most compelling use case for, for semantic versioning and, and having some sort of way of dealing with that problem is the security case. When people say, I have this thing and the only, or the bug case, the only, I have this package and the only change I've made is that it doesn't like, you know, expose all of your data to the universe anymore. That's, I promise, that's the only thing I've changed. You want a way for you as an author to be able to communicate that safely to the world. That's what the, the minor versions are for. If that's the only thing that you get out of Semver, that's hugely valuable. Like, like npm install this except not as broken as it was last time, that is a great feature. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we can continue in the breakout session a lot more on this, but I want to transition to our next question, a topic about documentation. So if we can all agree on the importance of package documentation, and I mean relatively because different people feel stronger or less strongly about it, but uh, if we can all agree that it is important, how can package managers do a better job of encouraging and maybe even rewarding discoverable documentation for all their packages? So we have a good answer here, too. Um, again, one of the new features of the new website was this was one of the things that kept coming up is that what is the, what is the readme.md for? Do we want there to be a documentation directory? How do, you know, do we want to like, you know, descend from the heavens and say, this is how you do the documentation. It should be in this format. Like somebody came along and said, you should specify that there's like a you know, JavaScript doc, like, like Java doc. And we were like, no. Um, <laughs> But we do want to, like you said, reward um, good behavior. So one of the things that we are, uh, we are going to be doing in the new website is we're going to be saying that if you have written your readme.md in this format such that we can recognize it, it will, be, it will become more than just like a solid wall of text. If you have said that this is an example, then we will put your example in a special place. If you have said that this is, uh, you know, this is your index, this is your... Um, um, this is your spec, this is your API. Like, we will treat those things specially and we will allow you to search for those things and we will uh, you know, display them better and stuff like that. So we think we should uh, reward that. But there is a line to be drawn, which is you know, at some point your documentation site becomes a website and we do not want to become like a generic tool for generating a documentation website. There are lots of tools for that. Of course, there are plenty of tools that have created centralized things, but I, I mean, I want to push back and say, isn't linking to the readme kind of just the bare minimum? Isn't there a lot more on the table that we should be doing to encourage much more diverse documentation? There is, but like I said, you have to, we want to draw a line somewhere. We want to say that there is a difference between the, the explanation of what it is that it does with the basic examples and the full documentation website, which is a complicated thing. And you know, for Express, you don't want to have, we don't want to build the entire documentation of Express into the, into the NPM website because it would be, you know, then the amount of complexity there or is jQuery, just too much. right? Like uh, the jQuery doc site is great, and I look up my functions there, and I don't really want an iframe in npm.org/jQuery uh, that has like the jQuery website. That, that Isn't pointless. this all tied back to the overall quality of the module? I mean, by by pushing people to the top who have good ratings, it seems like this is kind of taken care of in in user land, if you will. One thing that always is kind of I felt like it's a loose end of NPM is how, in, how it has its separate rating system and then you go to GitHub and it's like, oh, there's another star <laughs> rating, you know? It'd be cool. I'd like to see those two things come together so it's like, that's, you know, simplify things. Let's, let's queue up a mod to uh, give a, com a comment from the crowd. Go ahead, sorry. Sorry, uh, uh, that is exactly that is happening. People can keep saying to us like, there are NPM stars and there are GitHub stars. What is the difference between those two? And the answer is, when we invented NPM stars, GitHub stars didn't exist. Uh -huh. um, they, they, GitHub at, you know, GitHub at one point split from stars into stars and watchers, and then, you know, the semantics of stars became clear, but NPM stars predate that. Um, so the new NPM website is basically going to turn NPM stars into something more like a bookmark and say that the stars are the GitHub stars. That's what everyone believes are the GitHub stars. But 
Uh, the wrinkle is that it pen penalizes people who don't use GitHub. And there are, you know, that's 10% of the registry. OK, Mon. Um, perhaps to help with the question, uh, I'm actually challenging the question itself. There's a big difference between package managers and package repositories. And I think NPM kind of serves both worlds there. And it's kind of the unique situation like Bower, for example. Bower is the package manager, but the repository is actually GitHub. So for, when it comes to questions like star ratings or documentation, are we trying to answer that with package managers or are we trying to answer that with repositories? Yeah, it's a, it's, you're asking for a feature of the registry there, which um, something like something like Bower can't do unless I'm mistaken. Like you could not have Bower stars or you know, no Bower ratings. No, it's all on GitHub. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Let's move to the next question then. What specific functionality can package managers offer that supports the specific concerns of CSS and HTML and even other asset types, given their lack of modules? I think it's very simple. I, I, that's my perspective. I, I think it's a sticky uh, area, uh, but it's very simple to basically support the skeleton of what you need, which is basically an inventory of the other asset types. If we're talking about JavaScript packages, where your core dependencies and your, you know, your, your, your flow is going through your JavaScript, that's your principal object, and then you have these add-on CSS and uh, maybe fonts or images, all you need is an enumeration of which of those things so, in so, your repository. So we call that the file right. system, <laughs> right? Like it, the, there, there is a file system, and it contains an enumeration of all the things it, in your package. If that, if that's the, if if that's what everybody agrees on, then then that's what it is. Or another option was to be to explicitly list them out in package.json. I know you're not a fan of that, but yeah. it, it doesn't really matter which one as much as it being defined. So but in and, and, and one of the big things that package managers are responsible for is the metadata that we've talked about a lot of time. So if it's not defined anywhere and it's not defined in the metadata, then there's, it's really hard well, to I mean, deal with these other aspects. There's a difference between metadata and data. I think this is data. I don't think it's metadata. But, but, but we need to talk specifically about why CSS and HTML right. aren't as well suited for this as yes. JavaScript is. So you touched, so Dave, you touched on this earlier. The, the fundamental problem of, of CSS and HTML as a package manager and what NPM should do with, if it decides uh, to support CSS and HTML is that you can't use node module semantics to resolve conflicts. Node modules can be put into node modules can be put into the node modules directory, and there is an algorithm that works perfectly to to, to make sure that conflicting versions don't conflict, um, and it's it's one of the best things about Node. And CSS and HTML don't work that way. If you declare reset.css and your HTML is looking for it in the root, there can only be one of those. And as a package manager, you have to make the decision: is the behavior that my users expect is the thing that we should be doing? Saying that if you try to install two packages that declare the same asset, should they conflict? Should I die? Should I stop? Or should I say that there is some other, you know, I do some crazy rewrite so that they can exist at the same time, and then I go down into the HTML and, like, you, you know, right, you spiral that, away into this you, very complicated you're, you're, world. You're assuming that, one, that, that NPM or, or you're assuming things about the build process. That, that namespace doesn't have to be flat that, so that there's only one space for reset.css. It can be, you know, it doesn't have to be. That, that, and I don't think that's something that NPM needs to get involved in. I think it's better that it doesn't. Well, but that's so, a lot more intrusive to the development process, right? Because that, that, that's how you decide to put your IDs in your CSS or not and things like that. But yeah, the there, are, there is, are conflicts in semantics of CSS. And, and yeah, those are unavoidable. It's two, there are two files that declare the same class name and they target the same element and they target in different ways. You're gonna, your web page is going to look screwed up. But yeah. it, that's the way it is. There's no way to solve it. And what about uh, just preventing? It's like pure dependencies. You know? It's like, like a little bit of evil, but it, you know, it's OK. <laughs> it's a little bit like, like you said, I think like the biggest indicator is your website looks screwed up, right? And so I think how do you resolve this screwed up state? I think like maybe better tooling might be the, the way to go. You say, like, duplicates, NPM duplicates or something like that, and you notice, oh, there's two resets, or oh, there's two bootstraps here. Now I have to go investigate and figure out what the, what the issue is. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think the conflicts are going to be that extensive. I feel like the packages yeah. that do a poor job of targeting, I mean, bootstrap, I think, is a different, slightly different thing. I don't really think the bootstrap should be handled inside NPM anyways, being CSS. but. But the, if you have a, 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 you know, a, a JavaScript component that targets a specific CSS element and it does it badly in a way that 
you know, it conflicts with other stuff, then that it's not going to get very good ratings, and hopefully not many people will use it. And, yeah. You know. Okay. Well, that's a wrap. I appreciate all the panelists. I just want to remind you again, we're going to have the breakout. And the big question that we're going to tackle there is, what happens when somebody <laughs> compromises one of these package repositories? So come and check us out in there. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.